Okay. All right. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Um, I'm, I am sharing a presentation. The slides will be sent out, um, PDF copy presentation after the training session. So don't worry about uh, taking serious notes during this presentation. As Chris said, uh, my name is Kristen Kaufman. I am a contractor working through the FRPP system. I'm joined by my colleague, Alexis Plofchin. She's going to be running the actual demo of the system. So I'll be going through different sections of the presentation, and then I'll be moving over to let, let Alexis actually demo that in the system. Just a note on some important dates. The system with all of the updates will be available on September 21st. So we're coming up on that date pretty shortly. Um, and your submissions will be due by December 15th of this year. We are recording this session, so once we go through the whole process of getting it closed captioned and posted, this will be available for your review at any time uh, you would like. Again, we have muted the lines, but just for safekeeping, uh, make sure that you have muted your lines. Sometimes that does tend to get a little bit wishy-washy when the system likes to unmute some people, so make sure that you are muting your lines throughout. Chris is available to answer questions as he said, so feel free to use the chat and Q&A pod throughout the presentation. Um, and then we again will stop at the end to go through any questions over the phone. Okay, moving on. So for training objectives, this is our main focus for today. We're going to be going over those fiscal year 2018 business rule updates as well as being able to locate that data dictionary which is available now. Looks like we're having trouble with the sound. Can everyone confirm that they can hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to continue. Let me know if there's any other issues with sound moving forward. Okay, so by the end of this training, uh, hopefully you will be able to identify those business rule updates, locate the data dictionary, modify, add, and remove a singular asset through XML and CSV. Just to highlight that CSV is a new functionality this year, and we will go over that in the demo. Recognize and apply troubleshooting strategies, conduct an administrative search for users, uh, perform an administrative asset inventory clearance, and then at the end, we'll go over specifically how to contact technical support if you do run into any issues. Okay, so today's agenda, this is kind of the process that we're going to work through. We'll focus on those business rule updates. We'll go through user roles and login. We'll go then through the manual data modification submission and removal process. And then we'll go through that submission process using XML and CSV. Next, we'll go over the error reports and asset search, and then highlighting the anomaly reports and anomaly VNV. And finally, the end, just some administrative functions, um, and then leaving time for questions after technical support. I just wanted to highlight some of the new system features. We've been working over the last year to make some updates and enhancements to the system to make it a little bit more user-friendly for you all. So just to highlight, we have some new data elements that have been added, and those were briefed in the data dictionary training. We standardized the order of fields on all reports, so we'll highlight that both in this training and then in the demo. As I said previously, we have added um, the option of using a CSV for the bulk upload process, and then end-to-end -end processing of uploading a file has changed slightly. So we have different file status process designations, as well as a revised process for threshold check. And Alexis will again will go over that in the demo. We have some new anomaly categories and report functions, and then an updated search function. You can see there's a few additional uh, additions that we made over on that right-hand side that are not specifically highlighted in this presentation, but there's just a, a few things that we did make enhancement to enhancements to over the year. Just a note, 
for those of you who are familiar with the system and have been working in it, a lot of the information that you're going to see today is similar to what you saw last year. So we're going to go back over the information that you saw last year, and then we're obviously highlighting some of those new system features. But if you think you've seen it before, you probably have. So just a refresher to make sure everyone's on the same page moving forward. Okay, I'm going to start with the fiscal year 2018 business rule updates. And I'm actually going to turn this over to Chris to highlight some of these new business rule updates. All right. Um, I covered already the changes from version 1 to version 2. Um, these are the changes that occurred from fiscal year 2017 to fiscal year 2018 reporting. Uh, the real property data element, and again, just for ever, to reiterate from everyone from the data dictionary training that we conducted earlier this spring, the real property data element is an alias for the national security determination. We had to take steps to mitigate risk to national security. Uh, you will not find it listed in the data dictionary itself because the data dictionary is a public document. There's an addendum that I have only sent out to users via email uh, with the requirements for the real property alias for national security determination. That data element is required for all assets. You must provide a response. The next item is FOIA exemption. You only have to provide a response for the FOIA exemption data element, which is listed in the data dictionary, if you answer no to the real property data element. If you answer yes to real property data element, that means it's not to be included for reasons of national security in the public data set, and we will um, handle accordingly. Um, but if you answer no to real property, then we need to get a response on the FOIA exemption if it should be redacted for one of the existing categories. If you answer the statutory, uh, the statutory category, you then must answer the statutory citation. Um, what we've done is we have moved this from a manual data call, um, which we did in 20, for 2016 and 2017, um, into the normal data submission process for 2018 and beyond. Um, the next four rows on this table are all similar. Um, in 2017, there was a data element owned and otherwise managed O&M costs. You reported one number. In accordance with the memo that was issued in December of 2016, beginning with FY18 reporting, agencies are to split into an operations and a maintenance uh, data element, that one number. So there is an owned and otherwise managed annual maintenance cost and an owned and otherwise managed operations cost. Likewise, there is a lease maintenance cost and there's a lease operating cost. So you'll see that split in the data dictionary. Um, the last item, there's field office co-location. This was done via a manual data call. We have now incorporated it into the normal FY18 reporting. You only report this data element if it is a building, if that building is an office building, and if that office building is reported as a field office for the field office data element. And that is it. Um, again, you can always 
download a copy of the updated data dictionary from the link provided at the bottom of this slide. Um, you can also find the link on the home page of the uh, FRPP system after you log in. So that's the summary of changes. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Kristen to continue. OK, thank you, Chris. I'm going to move on to the user roles and login process. So there are nine user roles in the FRPP system that you do need to be aware of. So just important to understand the roles of each of these um, different users. So these are usually assigned at either the agency or bureau level. So you can see there's a note on the bottom there that indicates that agency level, agency level user roles have access to all assets for agency while bureau level only to the bureau. So starting with that top role, we have the data submission or agency and bureau data submission stage users. So these are for both the agency and bureau level. So these can submit data for their assigned agency or bureau via an XML or CSV file. Again, just a reminder that CSV is a new option this year. So they can only attach, validate, and correct data that was staged using XML or that CSV file. So basically, staging means that they can set up the file to be uploaded, and the system will verify and validate that information. Once the information is validated, the agency admin um, will put that information into the FRPP system. Those right users for both agency and bureaus can upload the data after the data submission stage user attaches, verifies, and validates. Right users at both levels can also complete any manual data entry in the application as well as manually edit asset records that are already listed in the agency's inventory. The agency admin can view, edit, and delete for their assigned agency. So in essence, for this role, they can do everything above as well as they have the responsibility for uploading and submitting the data. So this is the final level. They're the ones that are going to actually be clicking that confirm button, which completes the submission process for the fiscal year. So today we're going to be focusing um, on the features and functions of these roles. The additional roles that are available are the um, FRPP system administrator. So that person has access to review any data for any agency or bureau. So this is for the GSA program staff only. The read-only users for both agency and bureau have access to read information for their assigned agency or bureau. So these users cannot submit any data. They're only able to view that data. So for this role, the main purpose of this role um, and ability would be able to perform that asset search. So finally, there is a data anomaly user. So this person has access to data anomaly reports and the anomaly VNV tab. So we're going to highlight that those data anomaly reports a little bit later in this presentation. OK. OK, looks like there's no questions related to roles. I'm going to move on to the login page. So now we understand what our role is. How do we actually get into the system? So if you already have a login, you're going to be familiar with this page. Navigate to real property uh, profile.gov, uh, and that's going to bring you to this page. So there are several different ways to log into the system. You'll see that number one is just a click about for the FRPP system. Um, we also have summary reports and resource links as well on this page. Uh, this also has the, uh, the public FRPP data that can be accessed through this page. Moving on to the actual login area, so you see that there's three separate different types of login. Again, if you're in the system already, this should be familiar to you. At the top, we have OMB Max login. Uh, that's a government-wide capability and the preferred method for actually logging into the system. This is through your PIV or CAT card, so you don't have to do a second factor authentication through email through FRPP. This is just an OMB Max uh, option, so we do recommend you signing up for that. 
You can use your FRPP username and password in that center section. So this is the one that you created when you got the email from Verify Salesforce. And then finally, for our GSA users, there is a single sign-on available for our employees at the GSA. Okay, any questions about logging in before I move on? Okay, just to highlight, if you are using that two-factor authentication for the FRPP username and password, you are going to see um, get a one-time code received by email that looks like this. So many of you are familiar uh, with how to use that two-factor authentication. So for more information on that OMB Max, you would need to go to, uh, there's a website there, but there's also further information in this PowerPoint in the appendix. Okay. As far as passwords go, your password will need to be reset every 90 days. Uh, just to make sure that you are following those rules, um, you will be able to, you know, reset it after that, but you won't be able to get in after that 90 days until you reset and change your password. There's more information on specifics when it comes to passwords in the appendix as well. Okay. Now I'm going to move on to the meat, moving to the manual data modification, submission, and removal process. Um, this shows a high-level overview, of a diagram. I'll be showing this throughout the presentation. So first, at the beginning of a new fiscal year, the GSA copies all of the existing assets from the pre previous year. If any of our new callers have called, who have called in, please make sure to mute your lines. Thank you. Okay, so the GSA is copying all existing assets from the previous year and saves them in the application so agencies don't have to actually start from scratch. That right user that I highlighted earlier has two options. They can either manually locate and edit the existing assets, so locating the asset in the application, editing and saving those changes, or they can add new assets rather than updating the existing ones. After either or both of these options are completed, the agency admin will be responsible for confirming that data. Okay. So you can see here, um, when you select, uh, the, so through that process diagram, one of those ways is to submit information through updating an existing record. You'll note that this process will be the same for the removal of individual records as well. So to update an existing asset record at the agency for the agency or bureau right users, as well as admins, you would follow these steps. So starting with number one, selecting that asset search tab. You can see that highlighted at the top of the page. And then on that asset search page, you're going to select the current fiscal year. So we have it highlighted on this picture as 2018. The current fiscal year should be defaulted, though. Um, so when you're going into the system, just to note that, that, that that current fiscal year should be showing there. OK, so you are not able, actually, to edit any previous fiscal year data. So if you're trying to do that, just to note that if it's not allowing you to do that, you might be on the wrong fiscal year. Another addition for this year, we have added the ability to search for 10 agencies at once. Previously, it had only been five, so that is a new uh, capability this year. Moving on, you would select the corresponding reporting agency and relevant reporting bureaus. Moving to number four, selecting the additional search options, so to filter any results. And then number five, selecting the asset details report option in the report field, and then clicking search. Okay. After you're on the results screen, you're going to scroll down and click that FRPP asset ID, so you can see that highlight on number six. It's that really long number that's underlined. Uh, anything that's underlined in this system usually means that it's clickable. So I could go ahead and click that, that asset ID because that means it's going to take me to a new page. So once I've clicked that, it'll bring you to the asset, asset record page. You will see the edit, done, and delete buttons. That's that middle screenshot there. 
By choosing edit, it will now open the records page through edit mode, which is that bottom section there. So selecting delete will remove the record for the current fiscal year from the system altogether. So if you want to get rid of all the information and start over, you can use delete. Um, you can click cancel if you don't want to save the changes that you just made. Or you can select reset, which will wipe the entire record clean. So you have to manually enter all the data. Once you've made your required updates, make sure that you press save. So you'll see that save button over on the right hand side. Always find the save button and press it if you are um, not sure that you've actually saved the record. So for our users from last year, you'll notice that the add asset, edit asset, and view asset pages do look slightly different. The layouts have been standardized across those features. So it's going to be a little bit easier to find the information because the pages are set up in a similar fashion. So we do have a question. So if you press delete, yeah, so if you delete, that will remove the record for the current fiscal year from the system. That's correct, Anna. Yep. And we'll show that in the demo as well. Um, but yeah, just be careful with that delete versus the reset. So the reset's going to clear the information versus the delete that's actually deleting the record. Okay, so say I want to go ahead and manually submit a single asset record. So as you saw in that diagram, this is one of the ways that you can update an existing record. So go to the agency, um, as an agency or bureau right user, or the agency admin. Remember that admin does have the same rights as those below them. You can follow these steps. So again, navigate back to the Add Asset tab, so select um, or enter all the required fields in that um, data set. So you're going to want to make sure you select the current fiscal year um, it's for that information, um, and then obviously filling out all of that required information. So once you, um, once you have done step one and you step two, you want to make sure that you fill everything out and press save. Um, just a, an example, so make sure that you keep in mind as you enter the data, um, other corresponding fields may also become required. So you see those, those red bars? If you click one part, you might actually end up making another thing required. So one example of that, if you set real property type to building, then the square footage field becomes mandatory. So there are a few validation errors in the system um, throughout. Just a reminder, uh, make sure that you have your data dictionary to help you, so that'll help you understand which fields require alphanumeric or just numeric data. If there are any errors in the form um, they, or threshold warnings, if you try and save, a list of specific fields that need to be updated will be provided at the top of the form. So again, if you don't understand those errors, just refer back to your data dictionary. So once you've corrected all of those errors, press save. And then now that asset has become a part of the agency or bureau's inventory for that current fiscal year. Once you're done with that, if you want to add another asset, just press Add Asset tab again, fill out another form, and click Save. So just to note, this is the same process as last year. The only thing that's different is the layout of those pages. OK, any questions before we move on to the demo? Give me one second. We're just going to change over screens. Thank you. Um, I, can, I hope everyone can see my screen. 
Um, as Kristen said, uh, my name is Alexis Plufjohn, and I will be going over the demo today. So I first wanted to make sure everyone is aware that as I am um, doing this demonstration, I am in a sandbox that uh, has mock data or not that much data. So I do want to say it's not going to look completely like you guys might think it looks. Also, um, I am a user that has different user permissions um, compared to what you may have. So I just want to ensure that everyone knows that these tabs um, and different functionalities and different reports, they might not see simply because of the permissions. So um, today, I'm, or right now, I'm just going to start briefly because we're going to also come back to the asset search a little bit later in the demonstration. But I did want to show the functionality uh, and then I will be able to show the editing of the, of the assets a little bit later once we have at, added some assets into the system. So as, the, uh, as you can see, I clicked on asset search in the system and I am currently only a, gen, a general services administration user. So I can only see the reporting agency general services administration. Uh, I have the option here, because of my permissions, to see the, all of these different reports. One thing I do want to note is that if you are a data submission user, you will only see the asset staging report right here. I have the ability to, uh, as Kristen said, to pick different uh, criteria so I can decide whether to pick on building or on lease, etc. Uh, I can continue to go down if I want to get it, get it extremely specific. So I'm going to just press search. Based off of the criteria I just gave, I'm not entirely positive it's going to pull up anything because um, I just did pick some random stuff. But I did want to just show how it works and show that here we actually have generalized uh, or standardized excuse me, the different fields that are shown uh, to make it easier to find your information. So it's all of the fields that are on that page all the way across. And you are able to uh, export it to Excel, which I know we will get into later, which is when I will also show the um, deleting of a record once I have a record in there that I will show you how to add in a few minutes. The Add Asset page as well um, is right here. And um, I wanted just to note, I'm probably going to note it a few more times because it is a pretty big change, is that we changed the standardization, uh, or the layout, I should say, of the fields. So it is in different ways and is um, a little more logical. So if you don't see fields that you think should be there because uh, you're used to where they might be, um, just look down a little bit later or a little bit further down. So I'm just going to show how to add an asset. So General Services Administration, again, I only have that permission set. I'm only with that agency, so I only have that agency to pick. I'm going to pick pretty randomly. Uh, and just show you how this works. So actually, I'll take I'll, I'm going to take a notice right there. So if I press least, and then um, if you if everyone can just look at this out grant indicator. Let's say that I had initially accidentally pressed lease. I go, oh, just kidding. I wanted it to be the foreign government owned. You notice the outgrant indicator, the red line does go away. So I think Kristen mentioned that a little bit earlier, that it does, um, depending on certain fields that you are picking, you do have the, um, you might see some fields that you initially thought weren't required pop up as required, just um, to make sure you guys notice that. So I'm going to, again, just be adding some pretty uh, easy things into the system just to show. So 
Um, I also will note just for, uh, I always get confused and get a little ahead of myself, so sometimes you have to let the system, it takes a few seconds sometimes for the data to actually pop up, so if you just notice there when I first clicked on it there was nothing, just give it a second to kind of shift through what it needs to shift through. It should take no longer than, you know, one second, but I know that I have sometimes gone a little faster. So um, as Chris mentioned earlier, and also I think Kristen mentioned as well, uh, the owned and otherwise managed uh, annual maintenance costs and the leased annual maintenance costs, they got split into two different uh, fields for each, so four total. One thing I did want to note is um, on the earlier presentation, we had this field that said operation costs, it's operating costs, just to, just to be specific. But um, for this record that I'm currently looking at, I made the um, legal interest leased. So if you will notice, I have, do not have the ability to click into the owned and otherwise managed maintenance cost because it'll le it's a lease cost. So I am going to add some data there. And also down here. And as I said, I did this pretty arbitrarily. So let's see when I save it if I have any validation rules that I do need to fix. Looks like I don't. So uh, that went into the system, which is awesome. Uh, but I will. I'm going to take that away from the system right now, actually, by showing you the delete functionality, which I mentioned I was going to do later. So let's say that I just put this in here. I then find out, oh, you know what? I don't want this here. I'm going to delete it. So all you have to do is press delete, OK. And if you will notice, right before OK, it did notify you. It does have a second verification for, need, for when um, you're deleting something just in case you accidentally press it. So now if I were to go here and try to find that in the system, it would come up as not uh, being there. I won't do that right now just for uh, time's sake, but I will demonstrate it later uh, when we get back to the asset search a little bit later. So I believe I'm going to pass it on. I think we have one question I believe Chris is answering, but... There is a... Uh Question about latitude, longitude being required data elements. Um, if you look at version two of the data dictionary, give me a second, I'll get to the page itself. The top of page 20, no, excuse me. Top of page 28, there is a note box. Reporting of data elements 22A, 22B, 22C, which are street address, latitude, longitude, optional for structure assets. As I said at the beginning of the call, as a result of the Mobile Now Act, um, GSA reviewed the requirements. Um, of existing data elements as well as considering new data elements. Um, and though while the guidance will be issued next month, most likely you can expect to see the requirement of that note box to go away. And so that agencies for every asset will have to report either the street address or both the latitude and longitude. Uh, there was a question about why earlier, um, there was a question about uh, why the operating and maintenance costs are required for assets such as uh, structures and land because those costs vary widely depending on especially the type of structure involved. And while I acknowledge that yes, there are a wide uh, array of costs um, for different categories of either buildings, land, or structure. Um, we have to be able to answer the question to OMB and other stakeholders, what is the federal government spending on its real property? 
Um, so we have to look at that across all types. Um, so that's the reason that uh, those data elements are mandatory for all assets. And I think, unless there's another question coming in, okay. that's it. Okay. Any other questions about that manual data submission process? Okay. Moving on, we're now going to go into the data submission, modification, and deletion of multiple assets. So that's going to be through the XML and CSV. Okay, so we're back to that uh, data submission process overview. So this just, again, is a high level uh, workflow of the data submission process. So this is specifically for the XML and CSV formats. So again, at the beginning of the new fiscal year, the GSA is going to copy all of the existing assets from the previous year and save them into the application. So same thing as with single assets. So data submission users and agency admins need to decide upon a deletion strategy. So we are going to go over those options next. As an example, an agency admin can perform an inventory clearance to remove all current fiscal year asset records and then input via XML or CSV. The data submission user will then attach that updated XML or CSV, which is then staged and validated by the system against the various rules. As you can see, the process flow shows the users who are responsible for submitting the XML and how the data loads to the system and when the users can expect to run different reports. So for those of you familiar with this process, there is a new step. Instead of thresholds, threshold warnings being created automatically, you now have to manually start that process. So we'll discuss that later in the presentation. Reports generated will let you know if there's um, any errors with the data. So then you'll just have to correct that within the XML or CSV. And then after those are corrected, the agency right user will upload the file, therefore completing the agency's inventory for the current fiscal year. Okay. So that was kind of a high level. Now I'm going to go into the asset deletion options. So there are several options. You just need to decide um, from an agency perspective on which deletion strategy you're going to use. The first option is to individually delete a single record. So this would be done through that asset search that we're going to demonstrate. The second option is to delete batches of records from your agency using XML or CSV with that delete action attribute. So we'll show you what that looks like in a second. And then lastly, you can do an inventory clearance. So this is an automated process where all asset records in the current fiscal year inventory for your agency or bureau can be removed. So once that's complete, the admin would receive an email. Um, this is a kind of clearing house, so you would just need to decide whether you want to go through that single record, XML, or the inventory clearance process. Again, for those of you who have been with us from last year, this is the same exact process. The only update is being able to use that CSV. Okay. So bulk data action. This is the XML template. So if you've used it last year, this should look familiar. So you can find this document zip file located on the Home tab under the Document Library section. So just a brief breakdown of the template. At the top, you'll see that first level of the XML where it says Action Attribute, Agency Code, and Fiscal Year. So the Action Attribute where it says Add, that's letting the system know which type of action you want taken. So it's either going to be add, modify, or delete. 
So just a note, you can't do more than one action within an XML or CSV. So you can't do add, delete, and uh, modify within the same XML. You'll have to do those in different files. Okay, so this is the CSV template. Again, you can find this in that um, XSD document zip file on the FRPP home tab under the document library section. Okay, so just a brief breakdown of this template. At that first level of the CSV file, you're going to see that action agency code and fiscal year, just like the XML, just looks a little bit different. So just to note that the HDR always needs to come first in that line. So just like XML, you cannot mix those actions. So you'll see that add right after 2018, meaning that I want to add a file, you can't do add, modify, and delete similar to the XML process. Okay. So we briefly discussed the creation of that XML and CSV, so now we're going to review the next step, how to attach an XML and CSV file and review some of those related error reports. I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay. Moving on to that data submission process, so this is how you attach that XML file. After logging in to submit an XML or a CSV, a data submission user or agency admin would select the data submission tab. So you'll see that tab highlighted at the top. You would select the agency to which you would like to attach the file and then select attach file. So please keep your file under 40 megabytes for XML and then 5 megabytes for CSV. So just a note from last year, these file upload limits have increased, so that is a good option for you all. Um, but just a note that you can see that obviously 5 is a lot less than 40, but it, when it comes to the number of assets, that's about the same number of assets. So 40 megabytes equals 5 megabytes in the CSV. Okay. So if your file does exceed those limits, please make sure to break those up and then upload those into the system. Um, if everyone could please mute their lines. I think it sounds like we're getting a bit of a um, nursery rhyme in the background there. Thank you. Okay, so you will note that after selecting a corresponding agency, previously uploaded files and reports will appear. So we'll go over those reports in a second. Okay, so steps to attaching that XML CSV file. Moving on to after you've clicked the attach file button, you'll be brought to a new page to locate and attach that XML or CSV. So from here, you're going to want to click Choose File, browse your computer, and then find the file that you want to attach. Once the file is selected, you'll see that on the screen, and you'll want to go ahead and click Attach File. You can select multiple files if you would like to do more than one. Um, you can click Done once you've selected all the files you want, um, and that will bring you back to that previous data submission page. Okay, any questions about that so far? Okay, moving on to file status designation. So once a file is submitted, the system will begin to process and validate the information. So on that data submission screen, there are nine different file statuses when you are submitting an XML or CSV. So starting at the top, we first have processing. So basically this means, okay, I have started the process of getting my file into the system. It's acknowledged the fact that that process has started. The next step is validation and progress. So the attached file is being validated against business rules. 
for the fiscal year um, data dictionary. So once we've completed that step, um, if you get an invalid, this means that the file has errors in it and the data business rules have failed. So you'll need to go back and correct these errors by the agency admin or a data submission user. And again, just make sure you're referencing that data dictionary to make sure you've corrected all the errors. You can correct them directly in the system by running an error report, and we're going to go over that a little bit later. If you correct the file outside of the system, um, like if you are correcting them in that original file on your computer, it will need to be reattached and go through this process again. Okay, next is the valid ready for threshold check. This is a new feature, so this status means that um, the file will be reviewed more thoroughly um, once, or we're going to go through this process a little bit more in the presentation. So this is the option that will show up, that will happen after you've validated all of the errors with the business rules. So basically this means, okay, I put my file in, it's ready to go, I've met all the business rules, and now I can move on to the next step. So that next step is the verify thresholds. So this means that the attached file um, contains a field value that falls outside of the allowed threshold. So you're going to need to verify the accuracy, or if you need to correct the data, um, you can use that verify thresholds error report. Okay. So if you see valid, the valid status, this means that there are no errors in the file and the agency administrator can select upload. Um, and then that will be added to the inventory for the agency. Okay, next we have upload in progress. So this file is meaning, okay, we've uploaded, we've completed all of those um, validations and thresholds. The file is in, now being in process of uh, being uploaded. If you see uploaded, it means great, file's attached and it's been uploaded to the database. Upload failure means that there could have been multiple issues with that upload, so just go ahead and try again on the system. Um, this could be for several different issues. If you see invalid CSV file, this means that the CSV file that was uploaded did not have the correct CSV format or scheme schema, which means that the system could not properly read the file because it didn't conform to the business rules. So that could be like unwanted spaces, um, invalid characters, etc. So you'll just have to go through and review that CSV file. Same thing for the XML, if you see invalid XML file. So this is obviously after processing, so this means that there's something wrong with the XML format that needs to be corrected. Um, okay, so if you see validation failure, this means that the validation process has failed. So you'll just need to reattach and try again. Okay, and then there's also the drop asset identified. So basically this one is that the attached file contains an unexpected error with the XML and didn't know how to move forward with that file. So an email will actually be sent to the technical support team for this um, and to the individual that uploaded the file. So please don't try anything else if you see this um, option. Um, you'll receive resolution steps from the support team on this one. Okay. Any questions on that before we move on? Okay, we do have one question. The threshold check occurs after you have entered data. So the threshold check will occur if you submit data using the web form or if you submit either a CSV or an XML file. The clearance is clearing out prior year data that is used as a starting point. Um, so it's not until you take some other action um, will the threshold check occur during the submission process.
Does that answer your question? Uh, there's a separate in the Q&A. Is there an initial XML format check when the staging the file as there's been in the past? Check. Is that, is that uh, to verify, um, is that the initial XML format in terms of the actual data that's going in, or if the, if the XML itself is valid, as in it will go through the system structure-wise? I think even either of those structure-wise, yes, there is. So the um, invalid XML file, which is one of these, uh, and the in invalid CSV file statuses is indicating that. It's saying that the structure is not, uh, the structure or format of the XML is inaccurate. And hopefully the email that you receive will give you some sort of clarification on to, as to why. All right, uh, follow-up question on the threshold check. Does the system inherently have data points from the previous year to compare against? Uh, Appendix F in the data dictionary provides what the threshold amount is for a given real property type, real property use, and legal interest. So refer to that document and it will say for an owned office building, the threshold for uh, square feet is X, the threshold for repair needs is Y, the threshold for replacement value is Z, etc. That's the uh, reference that point that will be compared to determine what the threshold amount is. Hopefully that answered the question. Continue. Looks like there are no other questions in the chat. Okay. So pretty pretty similar process to last year. There's just those um, those new that additional ready for threshold check um, option. Okay. Moving on, we're going to move on to error reports. So we're going to look at the reports that are, are available for you to use if you need to correct your XML or CSV data files. Just a note on this, obviously there are different roles in the system, so different users are going to see different reports. Just like when we do the demo, um, the roles might be a little bit different than what you're used to seeing. Okay. Okay, so First, we're going to discuss the options um, for if you get errors during your validation process. So back on that data submission page, back on that data submission page, you can select your agency again from that drop-down list, and it's going to show all the staged files. So you'll see a status next to each file in the status column. So just so you're aware, the most recent file added is going to appear at the top of the list. If applicable, you may select one of the error reports under the reports column. So you can see those error reports um, on the right-hand side. And you can edit errors directly in the file. At this point in the process, error reports will either, will either be validation summary report data correction, or detail error report. These two reports will help you understand how best to proceed with the validation errors. If there are not numerous errors, you can manually fix them. Um, if there are a lot, you might want to redo your XML and CSV and try to resubmit. Okay. So again, this is also showing that valid vet ready for threshold check. Um, once it is ready, that, that you can see the difference between the grayed out and the not grayed out. Um, so you, once you are valid and ready, that button is going to show up and you can go ahead and click that verify and ready for threshold. 
So once the threshold verification has occurred, the status is going to show valid, and then that upload button will now become clickable as well. Okay, moving on to the validation summary report. So this is the validation summary report, the report that will display a summary of the validations and number of error by asset type. The main purpose of this report is that it shows how many records are contained in the file and also shows the error total for three different asset types. So those types are land, building, and structure. So you can see that those are the different numbers that you would use in the XML or CSV file. Both the agency admin as well as the data submission user can use this report so they know what to expect to change before uploading the file again. To use those links towards the bottom, you can proceed to the detailed error report or to that data correction report. Okay, so now I'm in that detailed error report. This is the report that displays all errors in, um, in the file at the data element level. So just to highlight on that. You can select one of the unique FRPP asset IDs, so that's that left-hand column highlighted on this page. This means that you're opening a staged record and then correcting the errors directly in the file. As a data submission user um, opens up that record, they'll have the option to click the edit button for the staged record, um, and we, dem we can demonstrate that a little bit later. Clicking edit will show what is missing or invalid. After making the appropriate edits, you would click Save button to update the record and then return the to the data submission tab. You should correct all the errors in the file so it can be uploaded with a valid status by the agency admin. Just a note on um, this page from previous years, the fields have been rearranged and the um, RPUID has been added. Okay, moving on to the data correction report. So this is some of the same functionality as a detailed error report, but the errors for the attached file are displayed at an asset level. So the previous one for the data, the detailed error report is showing at a, the data element level, and this is at an asset level. The benefit of viewing errors at the asset level versus the data element level is that it shows the level of magnitude, which may affect how an agency decides to make corrections. So this is good to be able to see, um, you know, uh, kind of a bigger picture and decide how you want to go ahead and make those updates. Okay, looks like we have a few questions. We have a few people typing. Um, Jay, your Jay Z, your question on count, country codes being downloaded. Um, that can be downloaded from the home page of FRPP. Uh, there is a section for reference. Give me a second and I will get to that tab and tell you exactly the link. Excuse me. FRPP MS Document Library. There are four links there for the listing of the GLC codes, which we do update as um, new GLC codes are added, um, primarily new city codes. Um, so there's one link, FRPP GLC, for foreign countries, one that lists just what the foreign countries are, um, then the link for GLC in territories, and one for the United States. Um, Marna, I believe... Uh yeah, to the report. I remember that that was um, one of the requirements. 
I thought it was a specific report that we had um, discussed, and I know that the city name was added to the anomaly report and to the threshold report as well. So when I go through that, I will be sure to point that out. So, yes. Um, and then, Jay-Z, you had mentioned postal code. Um, the postal code, the zip code, um, that is only required for assets in the United States. Um, there is not a listing of all the applicable zip codes, so I'm not sure what you're referring to. And then Marna had also asked about the data correction report. Um, Marta, we'll have to go back and address that in a uh, future update in terms of data correction report and uh, the uh, data fields. Prioritize those um, requests for uh, updates for this cycle. Um, JC, I see your note about getting errors for postal zip codes. Uh, were they, um, what was the format of the zip codes, if you remember? Because I do know that um, you do, I used to, when I was doing some testing, get errors if it was not the standard, I believe, five right. a digit. Five or nine with the dash, yeah. but we're not. We are not checking if you enter, for instance, one two three four five. We are not checking against some postal code database of all of the valid zip codes. Is one two three four five a valid zip code? That's not occurring. It is just a format. You can't enter four digits. You can't enter 20 digits. You can't enter eight digits. That's the check that goes on. Okay. Any other questions in the chat before we move on? Thank you for the questions. Okay. Okay, now we're going to be moving on to that threshold check. So threshold check, not a new process, but the way that that process has, is done has been updated. So once we have a file that is free of errors created by the validation process, you will see the status change to valid, ready for threshold check. And the verify threshold button will then become enabled. Um, I briefly pointed that out on a previous page. Um, until it's ready to go, you won't see that button as clickable. Once the process has run its course, if there are thresholds that need to be cleared, you will have the option to do those in the threshold warnings report. This is the updated thresholds warning report. So this report will display the assets which have exceeded the value threshold set by GSA in comparison to the previous year. You can select asset ID to ac access the asset record in question. On this page, you will be able to see up to 1,000 thresholds at a time, or you can export to Excel if you have more than 1,000. So you can e either individually mark assets, so if you need to go through each individually, or you can click that top check mark box, followed by check records are correct, and confirm that all are correct at once. This is a new functionality this year. so. Hopefully this will save you a little bit of time. Instead of having to click through each individual asset, you can use similar to um, like an email functionality where you're selecting all within that page. You can go ahead and select all through that top check mark box. Okay.
An alternative way of viewing and editing thresholds is to click onto that individual asset from the threshold warnings report. So once you do that, you will see the page above which lists, lists out the thresholds particular to that asset. Okay, any questions about those updated threshold warnings reports? Once that XML or CSV file um, is free of errors and the threshold warnings are cleared, you will need to email notify your agency admin so they can select upload under that upload column. So now that data sum, um, submitter's role is complete, so we're not quite done, still have another box to check off. Um, we're still going to discuss what it means to confirm the data, which is the last step for the agency admin. Any questions before we go into the demo? Okay. Give us one second as we change over the screen. Okay. So again, just to re um, restate, uh, I am a completely random made up user. I have the permission set for the Gen uh, General Services Administration. And what I'm going to do now is just go over how to add and update via the XML or CSV and show the differences between the um, thresholds and all of that. So what I'm going to do is I currently only have General Services Administration to add, but um, I'm going to first go through the XML process. So one thing to reiterate is that the XML process and the CSV process are the same once you get it into the system, once you attach that file. It's the exact same process, it's just the beforehand that is a little different. So I'm first going to do XML, I'm going to say attach file and going to choose a file from my downloads and attach the file. And then once I could, if I want to attach more, I can attach more there and then I press done. And I can go back to the data submission tab, which I just did and you'll notice it is in the processing stage right now. So the processing means that the Salesforce has picked it up. Um, that status changed, so you saw how fast that changed in five seconds. That changed super fast because I made a mock XML that was, I think, only one or two, maximum five assets in it. So the system was able to process very fast. Um, so invalid, as Kristen mentioned earlier, is one of the statuses that shows up if you have, if the XML structure is correct, but the validations are not. So this means that it has gotten through the system in terms of the structure, but that when it started to compare against the validations, there is something. So I'm going to um, use this time to show the validation summary reports and then also how to um, update that validation error to correct it in the system. Um, uh, if you are an agency that is uploading, um, you know, I would say 50, even 100 assets at a time and you get that, not that same number of errors, um, it might be faster to do it in the XML and then re-upload. Uh, with the uh, time optimization that we were able to get to with a bunch of testing the, the past couple of months, hopefully the process of re-uploading obviously depending on the size of your files, but re-uploading will not be as tedious as, the pri uh, as it was previously. So that process of having to fix with, um, outside of the system and putting it back in will be a more efficient way. So I'm going to first click on the validation summary report 
as you can see, this is the same as for users that know this system, this is the same as last year. It shows the number of files that were, or assets that were in the file. Um, all of these were a type 35, which I believe is building, and there was one error. So I just made sure there was one error so I could show. Um, you can either go to your data error report and data correction report from here, or you can go back and click data error report. So the data error report, again, I only have one error here, but it shows and tells you exactly what that error is. And you are able to click into that asset on this page itself. Um, and one thing that I tend to do is once I click on that, I can't really see what the error is because I'm not on that page before. So I will press edit. And then I will press save again. And the validation will pop up and tell me what I need to do. That way you don't have to remember what it was. So this is saying the FOIA exemption is required for all assets when real property is marked as no. So I'm going to go down to here. Here, and I'm going to see that, in fact, it was required. I'm going to choose one and press Save. And once that happens, the status, and you have, once you have all of your errors corrected, the status will automatically start or change into valid, ready for threshold check. That way you can um, click this threshold check button. So if you notice here on the bottom um, buttons that are all grayed out, it's because they are not in the um, stage that allows for them to, to, to click the threshold check. So unlike the previous process, this is, has to be a manual process, but you simply just press threshold check. Status will change to threshold check in progress. And again, depending on how many thresholds you have, it will take a little bit of time. And then valid means that in this case, there were no thresholds to have to um, look at. But just to show a threshold warning report, I'm going to pull it up. And this is the new and improved way that we have the threshold warning report that Kristen went over before. You have it showing, in this case, it's only one out of one, but it can, you can show up to 1,000 at a time. Let's say that it was 1,000 out of 3,000. If I were to click this button, it automatically would check all of the first 1,000. And I say checked, threat, record, checked records are correct. It will go to the next 1,000. So um, I, don't have a, I, I unfortunately don't have a file that, that shows it exactly like that. But just, just so you know, if you have thresholds that are, that are if you have more than 1,000 thresholds, you're going to have to do that process a couple of times because you, you can only verify the thresholds in a, in a thousand batches, in one 1,000 batches at a time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can also export to Excel. Um, export to Excel has the ability to also, you have the RPUID will come up as well. Um, so on this page, we actually don't have the RPUID, but if you export to Excel, we do. So if you need to find what that, that um, record is a little faster, you might want to just export it. Or, or again, if it's, a, if it's only one or two assets, just click on that link. So going back up to this um, file that I was working on before, it's now the second in the process because I just actually validated that last one that we were on. But you see that the status is, va is valid and the threshold check button has become gray again but you see that the upload button is now uh, clickable. That's because it, the system is essentially telling you everything looks good, I, you, can click, you can review it again if you need to, it's the same as that validation summary report that we looked at before, and you can press upload. Um, I'm going to upload this just to show the process. Upload in progress is another status, and then uploaded. And then you also will get an upload summary report. Okay, so again, as I'm about to show the XML or the CSV process, but again, it is the exact same once you get into the CSV, so or once you get the CSV into the system, excuse me. But again, so I'm going to say attach file, choose file, and then find the file that I need. 
attach done and it's going to automatically bring me back and it's going to say staging in progress which means that it's the system the Salesforce is essentially trying to pick it up and now it's processing and the same progress process we just went through is going to happen. I'm going to, I, the last time I did not click the data correction page, I'm going to click that now and just show how in this case it just breaks it down in terms of, um, in, a, in a little bit of a different way in terms of the asset. And again, you can click on the asset and figure out the um, error that way. It also just, it's a good way just to see um, exactly what is, sorry, I missed the page, exactly what, how many errors uh, are coming from that one page based off, of, or that one um, field error, validation error. So right here, this is saying the real property is required. Um, you could, it would have, in some cases, for multiple asset records, um, it would have, you know, 1,000, 2,000. It's just a different way of looking at it. So again, I'm going to um, actually go back there and I'm going to click on the asset. I'm going to click edit, save so that I can see, you know, remember what it is. The real property is required. I'm going to I tend to just do that, just to control fine because it's a little faster. I'm going to say yes. And as you can see, when I press yes, so when I had it as no, this FOIA exemption was required. When I made it to yes, it goes away. And I press save. And I then will go back to the data submission and I will see that this status will change in a second. There you go. And the threshold check button becomes clickable, which again I will click. And in this case there is a threshold, so I will just show exactly what I showed before, but it's the same process. You can export it to Excel. You can click into here. If you click into the asset in question, press edit and no, that's just because we're in a sandbox. Um, I apologize for that. Um, so if you click here, and you press, okay. So if this comes back, okay. That sh it basically what it will do is the same thing that the validations did, uh, which is it will show you exactly, it will say at the very top of the page exactly what the issue is. It's just another way to look at the thresholds and to see from a, a, a second uh, look what is going on. So um, one thing to also note is that when you're making the CSV, um, and I think that this, there is a document that's going to go out explaining the steps to make the CSV, but once you have made it um, in Excel or whatever you're making it in and you've saved it, you're not going to want to open it again because the different formats that are essential, um, specific fields need to be formatted as, you know, general or number, etc. And if you open it again, we have found that it erases those formats and it then makes you have to redo it, because it so it won't go through the system. So I know that we have a, a document that it will be sent out saying that, but just um, if you find, hey, why is this giving me an error that, you know, this field isn't correct when I know it is, maybe it's because you potentially opened up the CSV again. The reference that uh, Alexis is referring to is in version two of the data dictionary that's already gone out. Give me a second, I'll give you the specific. Uh, refer to section D, CSV technical reporting guidance. And um, in that section it refers to um, the point Alexa just made about once the CSV is created with type delimiter, not reopening that file. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we have no, we're going to pause real quick to first transfer screens, but also just for questions because um, that is the end of this part of the demonstration. And I know that that process, although it looks, does look the same, is a bit different in terms of being able to use CSV, but also the threshold check 
um, being a manual process. We hope that all of these um, changes were, are just going to further um, optimize the system as best as possible. So no further questions. I think we're going to continue with the presentation. OK, looks like there are no questions in the chat. So we're going to go ahead and move forward. So now we're on to that final step in the process overview. So we're going to be moving on to running reports um, and confirming the data section. OK, the second section within that data submission tab is the reports and confirm data section. So this will allow the appropriate users to review the information that was updated for your agency. So this includes both XML and CSV files that were submitted, as well as any individual asset records that were manually um, updated. There are seven reports available. You can see those listed here. Agency admins are strongly encouraged to run all the reports as an accuracy check. As a data submission user or an agency admin, um, you'll be able to run these reports. Just a note, though, that agency admins will be the only user able to confirm the data in the FRPP system. Once the agency admin selects confirm and zero errors occur, the data submission process for your agency or bureau is now considered complete for the fiscal year. Uh, just a point of emphasis on these reports. Um, we created these various reports to provide you either accurate or detail, excuse me, not accurate, yes, accurate data, uh, summary or detailed level um, reports about your inventory that will assist you during the submission process to potentially identify errors in the data. Um, we have been engaged numerous times with GAO over the years regarding the accuracy of the data. Um, we have added some of these reports directly as a result of those conversations. Um, but the reports are only, they're as good as, how do I say it? They're only as useful as the number of times they're actually used. Um, so when data quality issues are raised after the fact, and we come to find out that the agency has not downloaded any of these reports that might have identified some of these errors, um, you know, we can lead a horse to water, we can't make it drink. Um, so we strongly encourage you to download these reports um, to help you in terms of checking the accuracy of the data coming in. And I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, so Reader's Digest, make sure you open all those reports. Um, moving on, I'm going to move on to the asset search and summary reports. So now we're going to go into greater detail for both of these functions. Okay, so here's a list of all the different reports that are available to generate. So important takeaway from this slide is that the asset staging report is accessible to the data submission users and the agency admin. So the remaining reports are only accessible by the right users and the agency admin. Okay. As you might remember from earlier in the presentation, in order to perform an advanced search for a particular asset, a data submission user or agency admin would select the asset search tab. So once you've opened that tab, you would select from each of the fields to filter and narrow down your search. So basically this just helps you weed out any information that you don't want to appear in your report. So make sure you're selecting um, accurate filters just so that you're not returning so much information from the system. Select the report type in the top right hand corner Depending on your role, the reports that are available will differ. You can create how you want this report to look, so you can choose a couple of attributes. 
you are not required to choose an option from each category. So you can choose one from reporting agency, one from bureau, et cetera. You don't have to choose one from every single thing on this page. Once you have made your selections, go ahead and click search at the top right um, hand corner and that will generate the report. If you want to print this report, you, have, um, you can have a personal copy on your computer's hard drive. Um, you would select printable view from the report page. So you can see that the printable view, um, that once you click that, that will start a download. That's going to download an Excel fi file to your computer. This operation will maintain the integrity of the data based on the criteria used to generate the report. Next to the printable view, you can see an export details button as well. This will also export into an Excel file. So we just recommend that you're going to use printable view because without using that printable view, um, the filter criteria are not going to show in that easily digestible format. Another note as far as that printable view, when you download the printable view in that Excel file, it's going to say what your parameters were for that report. That's really helpful when you're sharing information with others to understand how you created that report. Okay, so moving to creating new reports. Um, we understand that there are some people that are trying to create new reports. We do um, highly suggest and as strongly as possible that you would use the reports that are already created. So the report functionality within Salesforce allows you to choose um, data from all throughout the system. So trying to recreate reports uh, is not the easiest. So it's not like an Excel file where I can just highlight a column and a nice pretty report is going to appear. It's obviously a very complex system, so it's a complex reporting feature. So first, try and use any of the reports that have already been created for you. Um, and if you can't find it through that, you can also customize reports that have been created. Um, if you can't find the information you need through that, you are able to create a new report. So, so again, just to be more specific, um, the Asset Search tab has the three filters that are shown on this slide already programmed into the uh, various reports in that drop-down box. So it is much easier if you go through the Asset Search tab if you're trying to uh, run a query. That way you don't have to worry about going through the Reports tab directly and ensuring that you have applied the three filters correctly because if you do not, you will get unanticipated results. Sometimes you'll get both 2017 and 2018 showing up in the results, so there'll be double counting and people sometimes will call and say, well, what's going on? And it takes us a little while to figure out how the file was generated and determining that the filters were uh, not applied correctly. So if you go through the Asset Search tab, you can be assured that the filters have been applied for you and that you should get the anticipated results. But that also does assume that any additional filters, such as I'm only looking for office buildings that are owned in a certain city in the country, are also applied correctly. But these three primary filters that need to be applied for every uh, query, um, those are pre-programmed in the Asset Search tab. So um, you should not have any issues um, in regards to double counting and the like uh, if you go through the Asset Search tab. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, so again, just using that Asset Search tab is going to be very useful for you. If you want to create a new report, just make sure that these filters are applied listed on the screen. So we have fiscal year 2018, asset record type as uploaded and active as true. Okay, moving on. We're going to move on to the anomaly reports. Okay, so we have anomaly reports and anomaly V and V. 
So there are some changes to the Anomaly VNV section. Just to note that not all users are Anomaly VNV users. So once you get into the system, you might not see this tab, and that's okay. If you have a question about whether you are supposed to see that and you think you should see it and you don't, go ahead and contact your administrator about that. Okay, so the anomaly notification process is the same as previous years, but there is a new anomaly category that is added based off geospatial mismatches. Geospatial mismatches. Excuse me, that's going to be a new tongue twister for my niece. Um, if any of these categories are different than the information given previously for the same asset, these anomalies will be made. Actually, it's comparing the reported values for certain geographic data elements to that which we determine through geospatial analysis. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to the updates to the anomalies function, um, there is an export to Excel feature that has been added that will allow you to export all anomalies to Excel. The anomaly page now works similar to the threshold warning report in that now you can validate multiple anomalies at the same time. So you can see that checkbox over um, highlighted by two. You can click that top check checkbox and that's going to check all of the checkboxes below it. If you check that um, and click Set Status Affirmed or Set Status Error CAS. Lastly, the column Previously Affirmed has been added to this page that will give you a reference for when the last time this anomaly was populated. So for instance, if you know this anomaly came up in 2017 and was affirmed by yourself or someone on your team, you can now quickly see that information and what year it was in. I see we have one person typing. Any questions about anomalies before I move on to administrative functions? Okay, we have two people typing. We can come back and get them when you go over to the demo. Oh, they just came in. All right, so Erica asked, does the select all check feature work just for Internet Explorer or just Chrome slash Firefox? Uh, it works for every function, or every, sorry, every uh, browser. I have, we have not run into anything where it's specific to a specific browser. Uh, Bill uh, asked, the agency provides geospatial references specifically for each asset, but city, state, so forth are one, are, and so forth for one main location per site. How will VNV report treat those value differences? Based off of the, and this, the, very quickly, the geospatial mismatches, it will compare the reported country, state, county to what it determines from what an agency reports as latitude and longitude. So, for instance, if the agency reports the asset being located in Jamaica, but provides a latitude longitude point that is located in the Bahamas. That's an anomaly you would need to determine if the data is correct, which does seem odd. Maybe, Bill, this is a, an instance where it would be. Um, or is the latitude longitude point incorrect because it's located in the Bahamas or is the country incorrect or switch that. Is the latitude longitude incorrect because the asset truly is located in Jamaica 
or is the country reported incorrectly because it's located in the Bahamas as the latitude longitude uh, showed it to be? And I'm happy to have an offline discussion in more detail. And I think that's we're up to date on questions. Okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on to administrative functions. So there are a, a few specific functions that are um, applicable to our agency administrators. This is just to show you a couple of housekeeping, keeping, housekeeping items that will allow these users to perform their job more efficiently. Under the administration tab, an agency admin can utilize the user search and inventory clearance functions. The user search function will allow an agency admin to search for users in the agency that they're associated with. It is, possi it is possible to be associated with more than one agency, so it would show both of those results. If you are, example, part of the Department of Interior and Homeland Security, you're going to be able to view all of those users within both of those agencies. You can search for the users by their login name, first name, or last name. The results will show you whether the user is active or inactive, as well as their access level or role. If you need to change a user access level or request a password reset, you can contact the FRPP support for that. Moving on to if you wanted to conduct an inventory clearance, um, again, this is for agency admins only. So this is to clear the entire asset inventory for their agency or up to five bureaus at one time for the current fiscal year. You can use your control button on your keyboard to select more than one bureau. This clearance will process, um, this clearance process will run asynchronously or um, behind the scenes and it will send you an email once the asset removal has been completed. You would clear an agency's inventory if you've had a discussion with your data submission user and they agree that they want to start from scratch to submit their data for that current fiscal year. Um, data submission users do not have their permission to do this though. There will be a log of the different inventory clearances that have been performed for the selected agency. So it will tell you the date that the clearance process took place and it will also list who is responsible for clearing the agency's inventory. So there is a column that indicates whether or not the agency's inventory has been completed or not. So this status will change from queued to completed when it has been done. You will not see the individual records that have been cleared. So just a note on that if you do choose to use this option. Once the inventory is cleared, it is gone for the current fiscal year and the system altogether. So there's no back, there's no undo, there's no whoops, recycle bin. Um, so if you do complete this process, just make sure that you're certain that you want to go through with this process. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it back over um, to demo um, what we have gone over thus far. Great. So I think I'm going to be doing a few different things in the next couple of minutes. Um, I, I believe the last time I did a demo, um, I was talking about just XML and CSV, and then we went into the asset search a little more in detail. Um, I know I briefly went into this earlier, so I'm not going to stay on this too long, but I did want to just show the different reports that are available here. Again, depending on your permission and your and what type of user you are, you will not see all of or may not see all of these. Um, we standardized all the all three of these: the asset detail report, the asset detail report codes, and the asset staging report. They all have the same um, sequence of fields in the same order, and all of the fields that are on the add asset page. So that was something that we definitely made note to do so you can standardize or so every single one of those three is standardized in the same way so you can compare very easily if need be. Um, we also briefly talked about the about the reports um, and 
just wanted to emphasize again, yes, you can make your own report, but again, um, it's a little bit tricky because you have to make sure those, those filters are there, but the way to make your own report is click reports, new report. This case, I have um, many different uh, place things that I can search by, so I think you guys would only have certain things, but you would do FRPP asset, create, and then you have to ensure that you put those filters in that were specified before. If you don't do that, your data will not be as accurate as the asset reports are usually. So I'm just going to now go into the anomaly report. So the anomaly VNV process. Um, I just wanted to show the geospatial mis mismatch uh, field, it has these specific um, elements that were mentioned before and also this previously affirmed field which is in all of these elements. So no matter which one you click on, you will see previously affirmed and it is just a fast way. If you know that in 2015 or 2016 it had been affirmed and you want to know you know, is this the first time that this scenario has come up or not? Um, it's just a fast way to know that. That way you can say, you know, it has never come up. Let me see if this is maybe wrong. Or it came up two years ago. Someone affirmed it two years ago. I'm good with that. The same functionality of clicking all at once, uh, just like the threshold reports, is here. So you can see if I click this top button, all of them, 25 out of 175, you can uh, become um, highlighted and you can either mark as affirmed or error. You can also export to Excel. So one thing that to note is that for each one of these categories, there are different fields that are portrayed within the system. So for this one, total least cost is here. But if I were to go to the legal interest anomaly, you're not going to see total least cost. So when you export to Excel from the anomaly page, you will not get a screenshot. You will not get all just these fields that are here. So if you only if you export, you will uh, if you export the change in legal interest anomaly, you won't just get these you know seven or so ten or so fields. You're going to get all of the fields that are within the whole anom anomaly system, but only the fields that are in that category will show up. So you can so very easily filter through and see what um, fields you need to be looking at. So you can export to Excel that way. Um, it's the same process as the threshold, pretty straightforward. I'll pause real quick before I go into the admin uh, administration tab if anyone has any questions. I don't think I see any. So um, the last thing is the administration tab. We have this user search here. So right now, it's showing all of the users within General Services Administration. Let's say I just want to look up someone with their first name Alexis. I can search that. And to these two users come up, myself included. And you can see the different users, uh, different permissions that, that they have. So if you need to see who your data entry user is, you can do that type of search pretty easily. And then lastly, the inventory clearance. I will click on General Services Administration. And let's say I wanted the agency liaison division to be cleared. I would press clear inventory. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to um, actually do that for this system, but it's a pretty step-by-step uh, -step easy way and it will show you and you will also get an email when that has happened. The last thing that I wanted to show, actually, and I know I said that before, is this, these were summary reports that we talked about. For, so if I'm in the data submission tab, at the very end, well, let's say I know I'm the, jet, the system administrator. Agency and I, administrator. Agency, sorry, agency administrator, and I know that everything is ready to go. I can run these reports and see, so I would view it, I would be able to view once this is ready, 
but let's say that I have viewed all of them. I think that they're good to go and I want to confirm the data. You have to put a comment in there. That's why I just said test. And I would say confirm. And then you see it was confirmed by this person at this date and time. And also the person who confirms it will receive an email as well. And we'll receive an email subsequently if any of the data changes or is attempted to change after the confirmation date. So I believe that is the last of the demonstration. Um, just pass one last. I think we were just talking about the technical support real quick. Pass it to Kristen. Um, are there any questions? I don't see any, so I think we're good to go. Okay, thank you, Alexis. Um, now I'm going to move into the last section. So this is just concerning technical support, so if you do have any issues with the system. If you need to contact the help desk, that is frppms at gsa.gov. When you send the email, helpful information to include so we don't have to go back and forth with the help desk is your name, the agency bureau, contact information, um, the internet browser. Uh, just to note on that, Chrome is the preferred browser of Salesforce, but as Alexa said, we have tested in all of the different browsers, so you should be able to use that um, with no problems. But just a note so that we can recreate that issue, um, important to include that information. And then any steps you followed and screenshots of the problem, issue, or error that you're experiencing. Once you submit that, the technical team is going to try to reproduce that error and resolve it as quickly as possible. Okay, I will follow up with any last minute questions. other type and why don't you unmute. Oh yeah, I'll go ahead and unmute the phone line. So if anyone doesn't have their phone on mute um, and doesn't want to be heard, I'm going to go ahead and unmute the line. Uh, so Nancy, the slides were shared after the first presentation that I gave, um, but I will reshare them. Um, we have recorded the training session today. Um, once we have a website link, we will send that out to users um, if you want to refer back to that as well. So there should be an email coming in the next day or so with that information. Does anybody have questions on the phone? If they want to ask now, go ahead. Uh, we still have a couple people typing, so we'll wait. No? Thank you. Uh, you are welcome. <laughs> uh, before we end the session, anybody else have any last-minute questions they want to ask? Um, all right. Again, thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, again, be on the lookout for the guidance. Um, that GSA will be issuing next month in reference to the Mobile Now Act. Um, and a reminder, that information will be separate from your December uh, normal submission. So um, you'll go through your normal submission as in accordance with version 2 of the Data Dictionary. Any new or change data um, will be included in the October guidance, and that information will be due generally the middle of January with more specifics forthcoming outline in the guidance GSA will issue next month. So have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.